Hi, this is Kevin Trainer. Welcome to my lecture for uh, Chapter 3 of the Zell 3rd Edition Python Programming Book. And Chapter 3 is about computing with numbers. And um, uh, again, just uh, kind of a warning ahead of the chapter. Uh, uh, Zell is a computer science uh, professor and uh, he loves math and so a lot of our examples within the chapter are kind of math heavy. Now uh, because the chapter is on computing with numbers uh, that's kind of appropriate um, but um, for those of you who are not so math heavy uh, and would like uh, some relief, uh, I'll try to give you some uh, relief along the way, so uh, never fear, okay? Uh, let's go. So uh, the objectives I'm going to leave for you to read. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about numeric uh, it, data types in this uh, chapter. Uh, so the information that is stored and manipulated by computer programs is referred to as data. Um, and data are uh, plural. Uh, okay, uh, These data are, not this data is. Uh, and the kind of uh, numeric uh, data that we use in computer uh, programs uh, it kind of falls into a number of categories, but there are two that are the main uh, categories that we we learn about in the beginning. Um, the first are whole numbers. Okay, they don't have a fractional part. You know, here we see a five, four, three, six, and the other are uh, decimal fractions, and of course they have a fractional part. Point uh, two five. 0.10, 0 0.01, right? So um, inside the computer, uh, whole numbers and decimal fractions are represented quite uh, differently. And we say that uh, the decimal fractions and whole numbers are two different data uh, types. Now that's not what we call the Python uh, data types. But the uh, the kind of piece of infrastructure that's going to hold each of those kinds of uh, values, uh, they're different from each other. Um, the, the, you know, the values have some different uh, properties and uh, sometimes the kind of uh, kind of operations we want to perform on them um, are either different or they're the same operations and they behave slightly differently. In uh, a lot of programming languages, the variables are uh, typed. Uh, so uh, traditionally, there have been uh, programming uh, languages that are strongly typed, like the Java uh, programming language is strongly typed. Um, the, uh, the Python programming language is not so strongly typed. Um, and uh, a part of its overall uh, scheme is that uh, it's the values in a, a Python that have a, a type. So uh, the variable names uh, are pretty free. They can point to uh, any type of uh, data uh, for people who come from a strongly typed uh, language like Java. This seems like kind of the wild, wild uh, west. Um, uh, but so any variable name can point to any kind of uh, data value, uh, but the data values have a type, um, and those are uh, uh, fixed. Once you uh, create some kind of value object, uh, it has a particular type or other. Okay, and it's the data type of an object that determines what values it can have and what operations can be uh, performed on it. Uh, so uh, what are the types that we're going to learn about um, here for numbers? 
uh, well, whole numbers um, are, are, are going to be kept in a type called integer, and uh, for short, we call it int. So whole numbers uh, are uh, when we create a whole number value, um, it gets uh, stored as an int type, uh, and they can um, they can be positive or negative whole numbers. Numbers that can have fractional parts are uh, represented using uh, floating point arithmetic. And uh, for short, we call those f float uh, types. So uh, we have int and we have float. How can we tell which is which? So uh, in our program, if we create a value and there's no decimal point, um, you know, it's a 1 or it's a uh, 25, no decimal point, then uh, that numeric literal gets turned into an int uh, value. So uh, 2, 5 right next to each other, 25 is an int value. Uh, a literal that has a decimal point is represented as a uh, float uh, value type. So uh, even if the fractional part is uh, 0. So 25.0 uh, um, is going to be a float uh, value. And again, it's the values that have a uh, type. Uh, so Python has a special function to tell us the data type of any value. So uh, we'll see uh, the function is uh, type, T-Y-P-E, and then uh, we put the value or the variable name in the uh, parens as the argument or parameter to the function call. So the type of 3 is uh, int. Uh, the type of 3.1 is float. The type of 3.0 is float. If we say my int equals 32, the type of my int is int. And what is interesting here, and this is something that's going to make uh, real sense uh, towards the end of uh, our course, when we really learn how to create uh, custom uh, classes in uh, Python. But um, it, it turns out that uh, uh, Python is an object-oriented language. And uh, uh, the data types are implemented as classes. Um, and one of the reasons why, if we ask the type, it says the class int, um, uh, that would indicate that uh, it is uh, implemented with the int uh, class, which is one of the, uh, the built-in types. Uh, if we say class uh, float, and it says... Uh, and we say type of a uh, 3.1, it says class uh, float. Uh, well, that is implemented with the uh, built-in uh, float uh, 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 type, which it's not really a class that we can access, but it is uh, it's probably best thought of as uh, one of the built-in uh, classes that uh, make up the Python infrastructure. Okay? So why do we need two number types? Well, it turns out they're going to behave slightly differently. Oh, okay, uh, it turns out that there is there are there is special uh, there are are special there are uh, special kinds of operations that we want to do on integer types that aren't uh, don't have an equivalent for. Uh, 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 float uh, types, and we'll talk about these. Um, so, uh, first of all, um, in terms of the values that they can take on, uh, if we have a value that has a fractional part, like uh, uh, three and a half, uh, if in fact you have an int uh, type, 
you can't have a value of uh, 3.5. You can have a value of 3, you can have a value of 4, but not 3.5. Uh, the second reason is most mathematical algorithms are very efficient with integers. So if it turns out that we can uh, we can kind of model the world that we're trying to uh, we're trying to model in our problem uh, space, and we can only consider integer values. Then we can probably write a a more efficient program to process those than if we did it with uh, floats. It would run faster. Um, the problem with the float type is is that you would say, "Oh, great! I think um, I would always like the option to have a fractional part." Well, the problem is that the flow type stores only an approximation to the real number being represented. It only keeps a certain number of digits of precision. And, um, oh, I think we'll probably see before we're done here that um, uh, the, the way that values are stored in uh, floats um, is in a, a kind of uh, scientific uh, notation. So it's only got so many digits of uh, precision and then we find out what power to raise it to. Okay, and uh, for uh, with some numbers that don't have a lot of uh, digits in them, well we can get uh, pretty close to that, uh, to the, the exact uh, value that we want, but it's always an approximation. Whereas um, ints are exact. Um, so since float, uh, floats aren't exact, we, uh, we tend to use ints whenever uh, possible. So if it turns out we're not really considering fractional parts, we'll just use ints. Like if we're counting things. It tend, we tend to count whole things. Uh, we're counting attendance at the basketball game. Uh, we're counting the number of sales th th that we made in the Midwest region in the month of July. Um, it, you know, typically we don't have fractional events. We either have one or we have zero. Okay, and those are the great things uh, to represent with ints. And you'll kind of see it as, as we... Uh, continue to program, you'll get the idea. Um, so it's pretty easy to understand how the math works uh, for um, uh, ints and uh, floats. So operations on uh, all ints produce results that are ints operations that are all done on floats uh, produce results that are floats, except for uh, division, and we'll get to that. So this isn't too surprising. If you, uh, if you add 3.0 and 4.0, you'll get the float uh, value 7.0, because 3.0 is a float value, 4.0 is a float value, so you get a result that's a float uh, value. On the other hand, if you add 3 and 4, which are both int uh, values, you get an int, uh, 7. If you multiply 3.0 times 4.0, you'll get 12.0. So the result is a uh, float uh, value type. If you multiply 3 times 4, they're both ints, you'll get uh, 12, which is an int. Okay, now... Um, Division is a little um, more tricky, okay? Uh, and here's where we, we learn about some properties of um, uh, division in Python that are uh, maybe a little unusual to the uninitiated, but they have a, they have a, a particular use that we'll discover in a minute. So if we take 10.0 uh, divided by, the slash is uh, divided by 3.0, we 
we're going to get a three point and then the, the, the uh, repeating uh, decimal fraction, three, 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 three. But as you can see, it doesn't go on forever. It does only keep a certain number of digits of uh, precision. And the last one turns into a five, uh, which is an approximation of the value. Um, and that's what we get, uh, three and a third. If we take a 10 divided by 3, okay, in uh, Python 3, which is the Python of uh, today that we're learning, you will get a uh, float. Okay, so uh, 10 divided by 3 is going to get the same answer as 10.0 uh, divided by 3.0. Okay, so what's this? I'm sorry. What's this? Um, 10 slash slash 3. Well, in really all these uh, programming languages that have uh, integer types and floating point types, we have this uh, concept of integer uh, division. In this, uh, I think in the textbook, he, uh, he kind of de describes the concept is as a gozenta. <laughs> so, uh, 3, it goes into 10, 3 times with a remainder of 1. So the, the, the slash slash is uh, integer uh, division. And it says, well, how many whole 3s can go into 10? Well, 3. And what's the remainder? 1. Now, we have another oper operation to tell us the uh, remainder. If we do um, uh, 10.0 slash slash 3.0, what we're going to get is uh, 3.0. And why are we going to get that? Well, because this slash slash is an integer uh, divide, it's going to convert uh, 10 to an integer 10. It's going to convert uh, 3 to an integer 3. And it's going to do essentially the same uh, division that we did uh, up top. But then it's going to convert the integer 3 back to a float 3. And we're going to get 3.0. Uh, OK, so whether we do an integer uh, divide with, uh, with ints or floats, we're going to get the same loss of the remainder uh, portion. You know, the fractional part of the answer is going to be missing. OK. Uh, now, uh, there is a, a way to get the remainder. OK, so um, the uh, what we've seen so far is this integer uh, division um, uh, always uh, gives us a whole number. So 10 slash slash 3 gives us 3. And uh, even here, he says, uh, think of it as a, uh, as a, uh, it goes into 3, goes into, <laughs> this is what you would kind of say as a kid, 3 goes into 10 three times with a remainder of 1. Well, how can we ask for the remainder? Well, we would say 10%. Uh, now, this percent is uh, it's called the modulus operator um, and what does it, it do well it does the other half of integer uh, division it gives us the remainder okay so the 10 modulo uh, 3 is going to get 1 okay now it turns out that this is pretty useful I mean, there aren't a lot of applications that I've used it for, but here's a here's a situation that I've used it for quite a bit. I'm trying to do I'm trying to create pagination in a web app, right? And um, I know that I've got I want to display um, uh, 58 uh, 58 items. And I want to put 50 per page. So if I say uh, um, not 58, I would say uh, 
50 per page. Well, if I want to, yeah, so if 50 per page. So uh, uh, 58 slash, uh, slash uh, 50 is going to be equal to 1. So that's one page, okay? Uh, and then if you say uh, if 58 percent 50, you're going to get uh, 8. So you're going to say, I'm going to get one whole page and a remainder of eight lines on the second page. Okay, so it can be a really nice way to figure how many holes have I got and then uh, how many remaining constituent uh, parts have I got. And um, I can't say that you, you know, you're know you going to be asking that question every day but there are going to be times when that's going to be just the question that you want to want to ask. Okay. Uh, type conversions and rounding. So we know that combining an int with an int produces an int, really regardless of, of the operation that's uh, between them. And combining a float with a float produces a float. What happens when you mix an int and a float in an expression? So what happens if you say 5.0 times 2? Well, what do you think should happen? Hmm, well, let's find out what does happen. So for Python to evaluate this expression, it must either convert uh, the float 5.0 to an int 5 and do an integer multiplication or it convert a 2, which is an int, to 2.0, which is a float, and do floating point multiplication. Converting a float to an int will lose information, uh, potentially. If there's, a, if there's a significant fractional part, um, what happens is we truncate it. Okay? Uh, so if it were really, instead of... Uh, Instead of uh, 5.0, we had 5.1, or instead of uh, 2.0, we had uh, 2.1. Uh, if we turn those into ints, we would lose the fractional part. We just would keep the, um, the whole part. Um, so uh, on the other hand, if you convert the other way, if you convert the ints to floats, well, then you just have to give them a zero uh, fractional part. You can just add a point zero. Um, so uh, the rule is in these mixed uh, type expressions, Python will convert every uh, convince uh, convert the ints to floats, and then it will do a, a floating point operation. And why does it do that? It does that because it doesn't want to lose um, information. If it goes the other way, it would be lopping off the fractional parts and less, less likely to give it what your average person would think would be a reasonable answer. Uh, there are times when we want to control the conversion of types. Okay, uh, and this is called explicit uh, typing or explicit uh, type uh, conversion. Um, we can um, we can put we can use uh, int or float um, as a function. Okay, so we can say int paren paren and put something inside it, or float paren paren, put something inside it, and that will uh, that will convert uh, the uh, the int to a float or the float to an int. The thing to remember is if we are converting an int explicitly to a to a float, well, we're going to have a zero fractional part. There's no information lost there. But if we either implicitly, like we talked about before, or explicitly con convert a float to an int unless the fractional part is zero, we are going to truncate that off. So um, uh, 2.1 uh, converted to an int is a 2. 
2.5 converted to an int is 2. 2.9 converted to an int is 2. Okay, so we don't round uh, when we convert to an int from a float. We truncate. We just take the whole part and we use that and the whole fractional part gets uh, disregarded. Okay? Now, what about if we wanted to round? Okay, well, we just would do something uh, different than a uh, type uh, conversion. Okay? Uh, to round off numbers, uh, there's a, a built-in round uh, function which we can use which uh, by default is going to round to the nearest whole uh, value. So if we want to round a float into another float uh, value, you can supply a second parameter that specifies the number of digits after the decimal point. And you'll see people who are uh, keeping values in uh, floats that they want to represent, uh, say, dollars and cents, you'll see them uh, round to two uh, digits. So let's uh, look what this looks like. So if we say that we want to float 22 divided by 5, 5, this is an integer uh, division, 5 it, it, it goes into <laughs> 22 four times. Uh, so we'll get uh, uh, the result will be an integer 4 and then we convert it to a float so we get 4.0. If we want an int of 4.5 we're just going to get 4. Again we discard the fractional part. Int of 3.9 only 3 it's not rounded. If we round 3.9 we get 4 if we round 3, we get 3, okay? It's going to use uh, 0.5 as the breakpoint, okay? Typical uh, half uh, rounding, okay? If we round uh, 3.1415 blah blah blah, which is looking kind of pie-like, uh, to the second uh, place, then we're going to get 3.14 we got 3.14 instead of 3.15 because the next uh, digit was a 1. That's in the round down category. Right? 3.14. So uh, rounding is uh, pretty popular stuff, especially um, when you are... Uh, one of the things that we're going to see in a slider or two, we're going to see that... When we're doing uh, math with, or, or even storing values in floating point uh, uh, types, again, we warned you that uh, fl floating point values were an approximation. And we'll often see where we'll get an answer that we think will come out pretty pretty evenly, like, uh, uh, 3.1 and what we'll get is we'll get some approximation that's very very close we'll get 3.0999999999999 so because this floating point math is approximate um, there's uh, quite a bit of call to use the round in order to uh, give prettier answers okay and this is especially true when we're trying to do math and we're trying to give answers in dollars and cents. And of course, um, it's, uh, you know, we don't do business in fractional cents, uh, certainly here in the U.S. Okay. Uh, let's see, here's some more examples. If we say int of 32, it... Uh, change it to 32. So this is interesting. This is, uh, it turns out that the int uh, function is pretty um, robust, okay? And it can take uh, different types of arguments. And if we give it a string, it goes, oh, well, I'm going to expect to get a string with uh, digits in there, and I'll turn it into an int. So if we give it a uh, 
if we have a string that says uh, 3, 2, it'll turn it into a 32. Likewise, if we have a float and we give it 3, 2, it'll turn it into a 32.0. Um, uh, it's also true if we gave it uh, 3, 2.0, it would turn it into a 32.0. If we gave it 32.0000, it probably would turn that into a 32.0 as well. So uh, both of these uh, functions, int and float, are pretty robust. And uh, not only can we use them to convert between int and float types, but we can use them to convert between uh, string and their, uh, their uh, natural numeric type. And this turns out to be a, re uh, a really important thing for us because you'll remember that uh, almost all data that comes from the outside, uh, typed in at the keyboard, comes in as a character string. Now, it looks like a number to our human eyes, but to uh, the computer program, it's a, uh, a character string. So we need a way to convert it into a number in previous chapters, we had been using the function eval, okay? And eval was a pretty a pretty popular way to do that in uh, Python for a long time until we got worried about hackers. And it turns out that, uh, that eval is a super powerful uh, function. It will evaluate any uh, Python expression. So it does a lot more than uh, converting uh, 32 to a 32 and 32 to a 32.0. You can type in any old Python you want. And probably the most uh, destructive thing that you could uh, type into a program is you could tell it to quit. Now, that's one kind of destruction. You disrupt the behavior immediately. Of course, you could tell it to go change data or whatever. Uh, so, the problem with eval, and the reason that we're not going to use it uh, from here on in, is is that uh, uh, when we tell the user to type a string, okay, uh, tell the user to type a number, and we feed that string that comes back to eval, it, it, it'll allow any old Python at all. So we could say quit, we could open and close files, we could we could calculate things, we could wipe out data. Um, it's really, um, it's the wild west. So what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be saying goodbye to eval and instead we're going to anticipate, are we expecting to get an int from the user, in which case we'll convert the string with int, or are we expecting to get a, uh, a number with a, a potentially with a decimal point in which we'll uh, convert the string to the number type with a float. And we're not going to use eval because it's uh, considered un, uh, insecure. Okay? All right. Bye-bye eval. Okay. So using in instead of eval ensures the user can only enter valid whole numbers. Illegal non -in inputs will cause the program to crash with an error message. Uh, uh, so let's um, uh, let's uh, think about that. Is that good for us? Well. Um, it's probably good for us in the following way. We don't want users of our programs to be able to hack them, okay? Uh, what we would want in the ideal world is every time we ask the user for an int that they actually type one in. Now, if they type in hi mom instead of three, uh, the program is going to uh, come to a halt. And when we say it's gonna crash, we're, it's gonna stop the program and it's going to give us an error message, okay? Well, that's not particularly user-friendly either. In the long run in this course, what we're going to learn is we're going to learn how to surround our code with a construct that will allow us to catch that, and we'll be able to reprompt again, okay? So we'll have the best of, of 
kind of both uh, worlds uh, that way. In one sense, we'll be sure that um, our program is not hackable in that kind of eval way. And on the other hand, uh, we're not, uh, you know, we can make provisions for uh, users who are not great typists or, or maybe uh, don't understand our program yet and are typing the wrong thing in. And we'll just, uh, once we uh, catch that, we'll reprompt and uh, the program is not going to stop. It's not going to crash. Now, one downside is this uh, method does not accommodate simultaneous input. Now here's what I here's what I think that uh, John So is uh, trying to say to us. Um, one of the nice things about eval is you can kind of hedge your bets. If you just uh, prompted the user and said enter a number, right, and you put the number into eval, well that would either uh, that would either turn out an int value or a float value depending upon what you typed in. Well, we can't do that anymore. We're going to have to guess ahead. Is it going to be an int uh, value or a float? Now, here's what we could do. I mean, there is uh, some cost to doing this. Is uh, we could say, well, if we want to support floats, like uh, somebody would in a typical uh, calculator uh, program, well, then we'll just uh, we'll use uh, floats, OK? And then, um, uh, then we'll be able to accommodate uh, floats, okay? And then you might say, well, that might give me some kind of floaty-looking answers. Like, again, I might uh, have, I might be expecting the answer uh, 3.0, and I would get 2.9999999999, and that is a cost. Of course, we could do rounding too, okay? So. Um, Yes, uh, we give up the possibility to to be as uh, flexible to process either int values or uh, float values with eval. But the possible evil that can be done with uh, hacking eval is is uh, great. And so uh, people have come to the to the uh, decision that. Um, it's a great kind of a learning uh, crutch for chapters uh, one and two, but uh, we're not going to use it after that because it's insecure. Okay, so um, um, here's a program where we're doing uh, type conversions and rounding. Uh, a program to calculate the value of some change in uh, dollars. So by change, we mean, mean coin uh, money. And we're talking about uh, US uh, currency here. Uh, so what do we do? So we say, um, uh, so we say a print, please enter the count of each coin type. And then we prompt uh, input quarters, input dimes, input nickels, input pennies, and you'll see in each case we are expecting an int. Okay, and that's true. I mean, do people have fractional coins? Well, one can saw one in half, but one could argue that you don't have a fractional coin. Um, you've got two pieces of uh, metallic waste, right? So. Um, uh, it turns out that, uh, that ints are very good for counts. So uh, here's what we're going to do. So we're going to, uh, we're going to calculate the total uh, quarters times 0.25 plus the dimes times 0.10, nickels times 0.05, pennies times 0.01. Now, I wouldn't have modeled this code. I would have put parens around the multiplications. I mean, I realize that the precedence of operators causes the multiplications to happen before the 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 additions. But this is uh in my mind this is kind of sloppy code. I would not I would not want somebody on my team uh handing in code with a uh, 
that uh, relied upon the precedence of operators. Okay, so then uh, we print a blank line and then we say the total value of your change is total. Now one of the interesting things here is um, um, I'm not sure that we're only going to get two decimal digits. Okay, because these uh, floating points can sometimes be a little bit off. So, uh, for instance, instead of saying uh, 1.36, it may say uh, 1.36000001. So, before we're really done with this kind of app, we probably would we probably would add rounding here in order to make sure that uh, we got a polite value of uh, dollars and cents. And that's just the nature of trying to do uh, business math with floating point numbers. Okay, so let's uh, take a look. Okay, uh, number 20. Uh, so let's talk about the math library. Okay, it turns out that um, this this uh, capability to write functions uh, is pretty powerful, and we've seen some of the built-in ones. Okay, and we've also put some of our code into functions. Uh, in particular, we put. Uh, We've been putting a lot of our code into main, and then we've been uh, calling main. Okay, well, it turns out that there are libraries of functions um, that uh, help us with, uh, typically the library is a collection of functions that help us uh, solve a family of problems. And one of the libraries is called math. Okay, and it's got functions in there that... Uh, could we remember the formula for all these things? Yeah, we could. Do I want to? No. Okay. And um, what's nice is that when we use the um, when we use the uh, when we use the math library instead of uh, trying to. Uh, code the algorithm ourselves to, uh, to generate the same thing. It makes the code not only easier to write but easier to maintain. Now I'm not sure we've gone through all of the built-in operators. So we've got plus, minus, those are clear. Um, the asterisk is multiplication. Single slash is uh, uh, normal division. Uh, uh, float uh, division. Uh, two slashes is integer uh, division. That's uh, that's the one that uh, throws away the fractional part. The percent is that uh, uh, modulus or modulo uh, operator that gives us back the remainder that we lost in integer uh, division. Um, asterisk asterisk is exponentiation so asterisk asterisk uh, 2 is squared uh, asterisk asterisk 3 is cubed okay and apps gives us the absolute value all right so um, what we get access to when we uh, use the math library are uh, more functions that allow us to do uh, math uh, pretty easily. Okay, so uh, right away uh, John Zell uh, jumps in and he wants us uh, to think about a, quadra a quadratic equation. Uh, that, that doesn't interest me in the least. So if you look at this and go, oh god, this is just trouble. Well, you're with me, okay. Um, now, can I do this? Yeah, I can do it. Can I teach you how to do it? Yep, I can teach you how to do it too. Um, but would this be my first example of how to use a math library? Uh, no, it wouldn't, okay. So John Zell's a bright guy, and I really like his book. 
which is why I use it. But uh, he's more fond of math than I am. So, uh, and perhaps uh, you. Although I do get a lot of uh, math majors in my classes from time to time, and they're very fond of math, in which case uh, I'm proud of you. Um, so the only part of this we don't know how to do is to find a square root. Okay, so we had minus b plus or, or minus, and then we have an expression. We're going to square something, and we're going to subtract something. 4ac, those are multiplications. This uh, symbol here is square root. We don't know, we don't have an operator for that yet. And then uh, divided by, we know how to, how to do division. Uh, 2a, that's uh, multiplication. Again, we know how to do that. Okay, but uh, it turns out that there is uh, there is a function in the math uh, library that does square root. So let's uh, talk about the math library. Okay. Uh, so to use a library, we need to make sure um, that uh, we have imported it. Okay. So um, imports are, uh, it turns out, are really a big part of hmm, everyday Python, right? As we begin to solve our everyday problems with uh, Python, we're going to find out that uh, we're not going to write all the code ourselves. We're going to, we're going to write code that uh, sews uh, together uh, um, uh, classes and functions and code created by other people and put into libraries um, and we're going to uh, we're going to orchestrate that and coordinate that into a solution so in a world where we're doing that we're importing a lot of uh, code from libraries and the first one that we learn about is the math uh, library so if we say uh, import math okay again this is a a uh, uh, directive to the uh, to the Python interpreter that goes uh, pretty high up in the program. Um, um, so we we'll often see it, uh, uh, the imports as the the top lines in the file. And it turns out there are two ways to do imports. If you say import math, that allows you to use any of the functions in the math uh, library. If you say uh, from math import and then you name a, a function, for instance, well, that is a way to document that I'm only using a per one uh, particular function from the math uh, library. Um, that latter approach is uh, comes to be uh, preferred over time. But right now we're doing it in a kind of a magical way where we're just going to say import math. That's going to allow us to use um, any of the functions in, in the math library as though they had been included in our program. It, it, it kind of it imports them. It magically imports them. They look like they're there. Uh, they're not physically there. They're just kind of logically there. So importing a library makes whatever functions are defined within it available to the program if you import the whole library. Okay. So to access a square root library routine or function, we need to access it as root, and then we pass it uh, uh, the argument or parameter uh, x. Okay, so when we... Um, when we use uh, when we want to use square root, it's uh, typically done that we give the um, uh, we give the library name, we give the package name dot square root. This is an unambiguous way uh, to uh, say that you want the square root that's part of the math uh, package. Okay. Uh, to calculate the root, you can do disk root equals blah, 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 blah. Not interested. Okay, so 
if, for instance, you're you're a math geek and you're excited about this, well, uh, t- it, it, talk to one of us and get us excited. But I'm not. Okay. Uh, so here's uh, here's a program that uh, that calculates the real roots of a quadratic equation. I wouldn't have chosen this. Okay, as as the way to introduce you. Uh, to uh, the math uh, library. We're going to find out that, that uh, there's a math.pal that uh, you can use for exponentiation, uh, which is a really nice uh, function, uh, which we could have done uh, simply, say, squaring or cubing um, plain old uh, integer values. And I would have been as happy as a clam. So I'm not going to give this any more time except to uh, point to the things that he's uh, done that we would want to do. Uh, here, he's got some comments up top that are part of the documentation. And then the next thing he has is import math. And he, here's a nice thing. Here's a, a single line comment, which is the only kind of comment that we have. But you can, um, anything after the pound sign becomes a comment. So you can actually put comments right on a code line and and you know the implication is I'm explaining this line of code. Okay? And where does he use uh well he uses uh disk root. Oh there it is math square root math dot square root. Okay. And if you remember that quadratic equation, it had a pretty pretty big expression underneath the square root uh, symbol. And again, uh, I don't care. <laughs> okay. Uh, again, if this is interesting to you and this kind of solves a range of problems that are a part of your mathematician uh, life and lifestyle, well, I'm happy. But if uh, this is uh, leaving you cold, then uh, come on, you're with me. Okay. Okay, so... Um, value error, math domain error. Not sure why we're worried about that. Uh, and we're not worried about this. Okay, okay. So that was uh, for me not a well chosen example, but we did get to learn some things about uh, using the math uh, library. First, we have to import it, and then it's full of these uh, functions. Well, are there any functions that you and I would be interested in? Square root, you know, the square root of four is two. Oh, okay, that's good. Uh, that's fine. I could, I, I might want to use the square root. Um, what kind of things might I want? Uh, pi. Okay, there are times when we want to do uh, calculations with uh, pi. We might want to get the area of a circle or uh, the volume of a cylinder or the volume of a sphere or something like that. So we'd want, we don't want to have to hand code pi. So we can just use pi. Okay, uh, there's this Euler's uh, number, uh, E. Okay, uh, we can use that. Square root, we've seen. Sine, cosine, tangent. Uh, uh, a sine, a cosine, a tangent. Again, if you're doing uh, trim, uh, trigonometry, you might be interested in a lot of these things. Okay, so uh, there's uh, there's a whole list of these. If you want to know what they are, you can look in the Python documentation. But if there's uh, uh, some math that you think you would like to do that you think, well, probably somebody has already written a function for this, uh, look in the math library. Okay. Uh, log, log 10, 
um, the exponential of x, which is not the same as uh, the power. That's not what we're looking for. Seal and floor, okay. Seal and floor are pretty useful things. Uh, this allows us to um, this allows us to discard fractional parts of the uh, number. So it's kind of like rounding, except that it depends on which part of the number line you're on. And I think I talked about this uh, maybe uh, a week or two ago. And, and this is, so if you uh, think of your values on the number line, okay, and if you ask for the ceiling, if you ask for seal, well, then it's going to go to the integer uh, on on the right side. Okay, that's the ceiling. That's the rightmost. If he asks for the floor, it's going to go to the left side. Okay. Now, those things are going to be uh, kind of different. Whether that's getting higher or lower uh, is going to be different depending upon whether the values are positive or negative. So if you think of them on the number uh, line and you think of them as uh, as seal being the right side and floor being the left side, uh, I think you'll get the idea. Um, so uh, now we're going to talk about, uh, by the way, uh, did we do uh, math.power yet? I don't, uh, I don't think we did, uh, but we'll get there. So um, accumulating results, okay? Now, uh, factorial is a kind of an interesting idea. And it, again, if you have a math orientation, you probably like this. But uh, factorial is when you take a number um, and then you, uh, you break it up into its uh, factorial parts. So uh, if, it, if it were uh, 6 uh, factorial, it would be 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 uh, times 1, OK? And uh, how factorial works is uh, we have an n, OK? Whatever it is, somebody specifies a number like, say, 6. And then we take uh, that number times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times n, and then we go all the way down to uh, 1. So uh, 6 uh, factorial is 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, 720. Why are we interested in this? Well, um, it, 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 Zell's interested in this because he's a math geek, OK? I'm interested in this, and he's interested in it too, because this is the kind of thing you can do in a loop. Okay, so you could do, you could be looping around using a, a typical for loop. Okay, and you could find some kind of general way to calculate the the uh, uh, factorials. The other thing that's going on is you when you're looping through. Uh, the values, you're accumulating the answer, okay? Uh, um, and so uh, that's the other pattern he wants to talk about here. Now again, um, when I uh, teach the accumulator pattern, I don't want to start off with uh, factorial, okay? And I, I wish that he hadn't. So we're not going to emphasize this, but we're going to uh, go through it. Uh, so how could we write a program to do this? So he comes up with the pseudocode. Input the number to take the factorial of n. OK, that's a, a typical kind of algebraic way to talk about a number. Give it a single letter. Compute the factorial of n. Uh, uh, and then, oh, then he said, that's going to be in a, a variable called uh, fact. Okay, so uh, the the 
the expression after the comma is his way uh, 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 of saying uh, in the first one we'll keep this in uh, uh, variable n and here he says we'll keep this in uh, variable uh, fact again I, I would have had a better name uh, and then he says output uh, fact so uh, print the uh, f the uh, factorial uh, value okay uh, so we're accumulating results he's kind of uh, showing you how you would do this uh, by hand okay and a, a series of results and you can see some kind of a uh, some kind of iterating some kind of recurring looping kind of pattern here so your general feeling is uh, when you've been programming for a while uh, I could do that with some kind of loop um, so what's really going on well we're, we're doing repeated multiplications and we're keeping the track of the running product this algorithm is known as an accumulator because we're building up or accumulating the answer in a variable known as the accumulator variable and one of the things i really like about john zell is not the fact that he's so excited about math but the fact that he is uh he's excited by programming uh patterns and uh programming patterns uh People have been talking about programming patterns for maybe 25, 30 years. But um, the one that we talked about uh, before was uh, input process output. That's kind of a, a general pattern. And here he says, well, there, you know, there's a whole class of problems where we're just, we're doing repetitive operations and we're accumulating the answer. Okay. Uh, sometimes... Uh, more typically we're accumulating we're adding it up people are giving us a value we add it to the total we add it to the total kind of like an adding machine uh here we're accumulating the answer it's a bunch of uh products so we are, are uh, multiplying and multiplying and uh, multiplying but it's still an uh, accumulation so this uh pattern is not a thing that they really talk about in every textbook but this is Generally, when people talk about a pattern, this is uh, a way to look at the problem that's uh, general, and you could apply it in a lot of situations. So this accumulator pattern um, is really probably one of the best things about uh, Chapter 3. So uh, the general form of accumulator algorithm looks like this. Uh, uh, this is a pseudocode initialize the accumulator variable loop until the final result is uh, reached update and then within the loop this is the work that's in the body update the value of the accumulator uh, variable okay so you just keep updating it okay you have to initialize it okay that's important part of the pattern and then we have a loop probably a for loop right and when we're going around the for loop we're updating the value every time around okay and then when we're it, then when we're done whatever answer we're looking for is now being held in this accumulator variable okay well let's look so it looks like we need a loop so what does he do he says well uh he comes up uh, with a variable name called fact, okay, and I don't know if this is a good uh, variable name for a mathematician, but for me, uh, it's not a good one. Uh, this is, uh, when you're doing a multiplication-oriented uh, accumulator, uh, you start off with a 1 okay if you start off with the zero well you could multiply anything you wanted times a zero you'd always get zero so a multiplication oriented accumulator always uh, begins with a uh with a one and uh and then uh he says for uh factor in and he has a, a list so again 
how does this kind of loop work? Well, we go through the list and this variable factor takes on, the first time through it takes on the value 6, then 5, then 4, etc. Uh, and then he says uh, in the loop, fact equal uh, fact times factor. And away he goes. So uh, fact is, is, I think, a pretty bad accumulator name. Um, perhaps um, my math uh, naivete uh, is one of the reason why I don't see it as, as brilliant as perhaps uh, uh, John Zell does. But, uh, so this is a multiplication oriented accumulator. Now most of the times when we're accumulating things we're, uh, we are adding them. Okay. Um, in this case, again, and most of the times when we initialize the accumulator in an addition and subtraction oriented accumulation uh, problem, we initialize the accumulator to zero. In a multiplication oriented one like this, we initialize it to one because zero is not a useful starting value in a multiplication uh, chain. Let's see where we go from here. Um, so uh, he asked the question here on slide 35. Why did we give it an initial value? And uh, this is uh, this is an important programming uh, concept. Okay. Um, we give things an initial uh, value because that's how you solve a problem, right? So for instance, if we were going to do this with a calculator and we were going to accumulate, we we're going to add and subtract a typical adding machine, right? Well, what would we want to do? Well, we'd want to make sure that it was zeroed out before we started. We don't want, you know, numbers from the last uh, problem that we tried to solve on the adding machine we'd want to make sure it were uh, zero, right? Uh, and likely, and likewise, if we're doing this uh, crazy multiplication thing he's doing, well, we'd want to, we want to make sure, that we probably wouldn't use an adding machine, we'd be using some kind of a more uh, uh, modern kind of calculator, but we would make sure we started out with uh, one, okay? Now, what's the primary reason why we want to start out with a zero or start out with a one, well, we want to get the right answer. Okay. The other problem that we have is, is that uh, uh, programming languages like Python don't make any uh, good assumption about the initial uh, 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 values for uh, variables. So, for instance, if uh, the accumulator uh, variable hasn't been uh, assigned an initial uh, value, and we go to uh, multiply against it or to add uh, to it, uh, it's going to the program's going to stop and say, "I don't know what value that accumulator uh, variable has." So, the reason why we give them these initial values of uh, zero in the addition and subtraction uh, problem and uh, one in the multiplication problem. Uh, primary reason, we want to get the right answer. But the computing reason is uh, we can't ask it to do math where uh, some of the variables haven't been given a value. Every time that happens, it's going to stop and say, I don't know what value to use for that variable name. Okay, so uh, two issues kind of related but uh, different. Uh, since multiplication is associative and commutative we can rewrite our program as uh, I'm not going to worry about that too much. Uh, why did we need to initialize it to one? Well because we were doing uh, multiplication and not addition and subtraction. Um, uh, accumulating results how we, it looks like we need a loop and I don't know how we got back to that but 
for some reason, I'm having a hard time with this. Okay, 38. That's where he wanted to get. Um, so, now one of the things that you can use uh, here, and he talks about in the chapter, I'm not really trying to focus you too much on the program at hand because, um, again, I, I think he's, he's got too much math uh, going on. But um, one of the things that you can do is if you want to get a, if you want to get a list of values, okay, you can uh, say uh, something like this. You can use a range expression. And now you'll remember that range uh, 10 uh, creates a sequence of uh, values 0 through 9. And you can say, I want to, I, I want to uh, convert that sequence to a proper list. Okay, and what do we have? Well, we get a list with the values 0 through 9. Okay, well, what if, what if we use a little bit, um, uh, a little bit uh, more uh, challenging version of range? Okay, so what is, it, what if you have two values? Well, the first one's the start of value, okay? Uh, that's fine. What's the second one? Well, you'd think it's the stop value, okay? But look what you get. If you say list of range 5, 10, do you get a 10? No, you don't. You get a 9. So, oddly enough, and I, again, I think this has to do with some uh, programming language uh, design uh, uh, considerations that are kind of lost on me. What we have here is we say that 10, the second thing, that's the first value that we don't want. So stop with 9. Wouldn't it have been easier to put 9 and have it stop with 9? I think so, okay? And I'm sure that somebody has a computer science class uh, somewhere, um, and they can say, oh, I know why do they do 10 because it's more efficient and it's, it's more... It's more elegant. For me, it's just the pain in the rump. Okay, so the second value that you give, that's the first value that you don't want. It's the one after the stop value. Okay, it's the one after the last value. I guess you could say it's the stop uh, uh, value. It's the value when you've gone too far. Okay, instead of the last one that you want to use. So we used a 10, it started with, it stopped with a, a 9. What if you give a third uh, value? Uh, this is an increment by. So this says, I want to start at 5. I get, when I get to 10, I've gone too far. And I want to increment each one by 2. So I get 5, and then I get 7, and then I get 9. And then I would get 11, but I've gone too far, okay? Because 10 was the gone too far number, and 11 is even higher than that. So range 5, 10, 2 will get you 5, 7, 9. Now this whole kind of thing where uh, the second one is, you know, the one too far number, it's the number after you want to stop, uh, again, um, <laughs> It's incredible. I don't think it's very descriptive to the average human being, but that's the way it works. And we're going to live with it. Okay. All right. Let's see what else we can find here. Uh, okay. Using this souped up range statement, we can do a range for a for loop a couple of different ways. We can count up from uh, 2 to n. Okay. So how do we do that? Well, we started 2. And when have we gone too far? Well, when we, when we get past n, we get to n plus 1. Okay. Uh, or we can count uh, it down from n uh, to 2. So we can start at n. Okay. Uh, we're counting down. So the increment value is minus 1. When have we gone too far? Well, when we get to 1. So we're going to stop at Two. Okay, it's an odd way of expressing oneself, but that's what we do. 
Okay. So this is the completed factorial program. Let's see. Uh, he has an eval. Okay. I wouldn't have used eval. I would have used int. I think they forgot to update this uh, slide. Okay. So uh, we're looking for an int. So that's that's an opportunity to to improve that program. Okay. And then uh, uh, he's doing. Uh, Okay, so the number is n. So he wants to start with n. He wants to he wants to stop before he gets the one. Why? Well, because the multiply by one is just going to give you the same answer. So he wants to stop at uh, two, and then he wants to go down by one each time. Okay, that works. So for factor in range, he says uh, fact times uh, factor. All right, and this this is kind of interesting, but again, I apologize if you don't get excited with this uh, math stuff. Um, this could be turning you off. Sorry about that. We did say that the chapter was about numbers, though, right? Okay, consider yourself having been warned. Okay. So let's see. Now the numbers can get big really fast. So the factorial of 100 is this big, all these digits. Wow, that's a pretty big number. Now one of the cool things here is uh, that in a lot of programming languages and in earlier versions of Python, um, ints only got so big. Okay, and why did they get so big? Well, uh, it depends on the kind of computer that you're on, but if you were on a 32-bit uh, uh, a uh, computer, then uh, uh, with 32-bit arithmetic is the kind you do, and um, it would be a number that uh, could fit into a 32-bit uh, register for addition. Okay, and if you were on a 64-bit uh, computer, then uh, it would be uh, uh, it it would have twice the digits that it could hold. Okay, well, somebody in the Python world uh, decided that uh, we want to we want to work with big integers all the time, and so what they did is that they've made this automatic. Um, if the value that we have is uh, a small-ish, we store it in some kind of a conventional way, um, in the way that we used to store uh, a computer ints. And once it gets uh, too big for the, uh, the classic int that fits on our uh, computing uh, machine, it starts to store it in a whole kind of a, a custom uh, way. It uh, it uh, it does it does the math. It will uh, it will work with um, arbitrarily large uh, integers. Okay, and it's pretty seamless. So one of the things that's really nice for us is we don't have to worry uh, it's so big. Well. Um, when is a number too big to fit into an int? Well, uh, uh, there's a practical limit. I think it might be 128 digits or uh, something like that. That's the default. But it's it's not uh, it's not relevant to us. Okay. So uh, it turns out that just because of the magic of the way they uh, they store and process ints in uh, Python 3, uh, we don't have to worry uh, about our ints getting uh, too big in any of our uh, practical problems. Pretty nice. Uh, but it turns out that older versions of Python can't handle it. So Python 2 or Python 1.5.2 could not handle this, which is why we use uh, Python 3. Okay. 
And it's one of the things that uh, got me to Python 3 because uh, it's, it's a really nice uh, feature. Uh, oh, okay, so here's a couple of slides that uh, say what I just said. I forgot the slide was here. I'm sorry. Um, so uh, the range that can be represented used to uh, depend upon the number of bits uh, a particular uh, the computer had. Um, they were typically either 32 bits or 64 uh, bits. Um, so how does that work? Ours is a lot uh, bigger than that. Well, it just sort of automatically goes into a more flexible storage and uh, mathematics scheme. Um, so uh, what we used to have to do before we had these uh, arbitrarily large integers in uh, Python 3, which are a really nice uh, convenience, is people would decide, well, uh, then we're going to have to go to floating point. Now the thing about uh, floating point numbers is uh, they can represent very big and very small uh, values. Okay, because they use essentially uh, scientific notation. So this is uh, essentially 2.6 blah 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 times 10 to the 32nd uh, power. Well, what's good about that? It's good that it's really big. What's uh, bad about that? It's an approximate answer. It's using uh, scientific notation, and we only get these uh, digits of uh, precision. Okay? So um, if we're expecting an int answer, and it's going to get uh, kind of arbitrarily big, uh, we just use a uh, plain old ints in uh, Python 3, and we don't have to resort to floats, which would have given us uh, big answers, but a little more approximate than we often need. Okay. Um, so uh, very large and very small numbers are expressed in scientific or exponential uh, notation. So. Again, you can see here that the number that we saw before is uh, the, these are the significant uh, digits that we're keeping times 10 to the 32nd. Okay, here the decimal needs to be moved to the right 32 decimal places to get the original number, but there are only 16 uh, digits. So 16 digits of precision have been lost. Okay, so yeah, we're going to go to the right, and, and how are we going to add the other uh, uh, things? Well, we're going to have to assume they're uh, zero, because we don't actually know. So floating point uh, values are very good in that they allow you to, I mean, there's a, uh, there's a reason why we call it scientific notation, because uh, scientific inquiry, um, especially astronomical inquiry, got us into very large uh, values. And some uh, scientific inquiry got us into very small uh, fractional values. And um, so a uh, floating point uh, type allows us to represent very large and very small numbers, but we just have to deal with um, it, we only have the precision of the digits uh, that we have. And for the most part, we're assuming that all the others are uh, zeros. Okay. Uh, so floats are approximation. They allow us to represent a larger range of uh, values, but with a fixed precision. Python has a solution expanding ints. So this is pretty magical. Uh, this is as good a feature as a programming language that I've uh, used uh, has. Okay, so um, uh, for instance, the Java programming uh, language has, has, has uh, 
many sizes of ints and they do have arbitrarily large ints but they are uh, they are I implemented with a whole separate uh, class so um, it's not transparent uh, the really nice thing about the Python 3 is we get these arbitrarily l large uh, integer uh, values and uh, we get to treat them as uh, plain old ints. It's really um, it's really a sweet deal. Um, so that's the uh, answer. Okay, so uh, let's review for just a minute before we wrap up, okay? So we've been through um, this working with uh, numbers and uh, Python, and there's uh, uh, a couple of general things the, that we want to remember. One is that in Python, it's the values that have a type, okay? In some other languages like, say, Java, um, um, the uh, certainly the values uh, have a type, but the uh, each one of your uh, uh, variables uh, you declare it in a way that it can only hold uh, hold a certain type, and if you try to give it another type, it uh, it gets angry. Okay, they think that that's a uh, safety feature, and uh, you do get some safety from it. But uh, we don't have that. In Python, um, uh, variable names are just uh, names. And they help us define uh, values that are objects. And um, uh, any variable name can point to any uh, value object. And you have to actually go there and look at the value object to see what uh, type it is. If it's a number, um, uh, typically it's either going to be an int or a float, although there are uh, decimals and other kinds of uh, numbers that are implemented with library uh, classes, um, but we're not going to be uh, dealing with them right now. Okay, so um, we've got floats and ints, and uh, floats uh, are really nice in that they can be uh, they can represent a very small uh, number, a very fractional number, or a very large uh, number. But they are challenged in that they only hold uh, so many digits of uh, precision. Okay, um, And they're pretty good for uh, uh, scientific inquiry. And in fact, the, the notation that they use is uh, scientific notation. We also know that um, uh, that uh, ints are whole numbers. Uh, they don't have a fractional part. Um, and we learned some rules of how to do math with uh, ints and how to do math with uh, floats. Um, we learned some uh, considerations when we mix them. We also learned about that special integer uh, divide in which uh, uh, which kind of works like a uh, gozenta, and the uh, the the percent or the modulus operator, which gives us the remainder, uh, which is uh, sort of the companion to the integer uh, divide. And uh, lastly, lastly, we learned that uh, that uh, the uh, Python three ints can be arbitrarily large, which is uh, kind of sweet. Okay, we don't have to worry about the, them getting uh, too large. Um, and uh, we learned about this accumulator pattern. And when we're doing the assignments, uh, most of the assignments are going to include some aspect of this accumulator pattern. The example um, in the chapter used uh, multiplication. But uh, we're going to, for the most part, be using addition, which is a more conventional accumulator uh, pattern, which means that uh, we're going to initialize our accumulator with a value of zero, because um, that's what you basically do when you're working with an adding machine. And the accumulator uh, pattern is like working with an adding machine.
So uh, that's it for the chapter. Um, I'll uh, I'll be back soon with uh, more. Bye bye.